Along with my slides, the link is up on the screen, so you can have those there in front of you. Um, to start off with, let's see who's here today. Oh, did you want a picture of that? <laughs> okay. Um, let's see who's here today. So how many of you in the room are business owners? Or I started with the wrong one. How many of you are content writers? <laughs> like me. Awesome. If you're aspiring, that counts. You're writing. Um, well, you have my job, and that's what I do, so you'll enjoy this talk, but also it's for other people. Um, so, who's a business owner? Awesome. Um, who in here is a marketing manager? Sweet. You guys also have a lot of hats and a lot of things to deal with, like business owners do. <laughs> um, freelancers? How many of you are freelancers? Cool. So even though this is a talk about making content part of company culture, it's also really good for freelancers because it does give you the tools to work with your clients um, in a different way. How many of you in here are developers? Wow. <laughs> I actually expected more than that, but that's kind of good. Um, developers do write content too. They write documentation most of the time, so it's different. Um, and did I miss any titles? Who else is in here? Anybody? Good. I'm kind of happy about that. Um, so, sorry, this talk, um, it will help you no matter what role you're in with your business. Um, I've basically traveled around writing as a freelancer, working for companies, as a marketing manager, as a content writer, and I've actually tried to own a business. So I've worn all the hats that you've worn. Um, I've even been a developer, but not with the title. I've just had to do some dev work. So um, all of us do a lot of things, especially in WordPress, and I think that um, content really helps drive your business and um, quality content is what you need. So um, a lot of people will tell you that you don't need a blog, but I'm gonna ask you, do you have a blog? It's okay to say no. Um, so who has a blog? Cool, who doesn't have a blog? Awesome. So today I'm gonna tell you why you should start one. Um, I've, <laughs> I've heard a lot of people say that you don't need a blog, but the answer is always yes. It's 100% yes, you need a blog. Um, it might not need to be called a blog, but you need to have some sort of regular content produced on your site. So also, no, you don't need a blog because it doesn't need to be called a blog. You can call it anything. You can have certain, um, you can produce eBooks. You can produce white papers. Documentation is huge in WordPress. When you're updating your documentation, um, you're also updating the content on your website. So it helps your users and it helps search engines find you. Um, at Give, some of our highest ranking pages are actually our documentation pages. So it's one of the highest visited, trafficked, and um, landing page sections on our analytics. It's interesting. And then resources. So if you don't have a blog, but you're a business that could provide resources for people, that's another way that you can produce content. Landing pages, that's a type of content that you can produce that is um, similar to the way that you would produce a blog. So the biggest takeaway when you do start to produce content for your company is to make sure that you're showing value. If you're stuffing your blog with keywords and you're just producing posts to rank in SEO, you're doing it entirely wrong because you're not blogging for your audience, you're blogging for yourself. Um, when you, uh, I, I love using this business example. I came across a um, rehab center who had this blog stuffed with all of these keywords and they had tons of posts, but every single post was um, geared towards somebody who was an addict. And when you think about the, the type of person who's gonna be looking at a rehab facility, it's not gonna be the addict, it's gonna be their family member. So they weren't really thinking about who's gonna come across my site, what value can I give them, and what, how can I engage them? Um, so you really need to make sure that you're engaging your audience with what they're looking for. Um, and yesterday, Cami did a talk on blogging for business and better blogging for business. And she talked a lot about asking yourself what, what your users would want to see from you. How would they be looking for what you're providing? And that's really how you need to think about producing content. It's not about you. It's about your users and your, your customers. Um, and if you're not convinced yet, I'm gonna show you some data from HubSpot. So the impact of blogging and producing regular content on your website obviously will produce more traffic. Um, and that's because you're showing people that you're a leader in your industry and so they want to come back to you for information. You're building trust in your brand and in your business because you're providing that information, that expertise, and you're also providing um, insight into your company in most cases. So with WordPress plugins particularly, um, we, we publish um, our change logs, but instead of just keeping them on GitHub or in the background, we publish them as a blog post with WP Business Reviews so that it can go out there as content 
and people know what we're doing as a business. Um, when something is in demand and we're not quite there yet, we publish a post saying why we're not doing it yet. Um, and the same thing can, can go on with your business. So if you, um, maybe you get a bad business review and you're like, man, this looks really bad on my business, how can I address this? You can become really transparent with your audience by posting that in a blog post and talking about it. So that's a way to just build your reputation. But that's all fine and dandy. How does that translate into business goals? How do you make sales off of this content? You get more leads the more you post. So the more, the more you post, the more traffic you're gonna get, the more leads you're gonna get, the more sales you're gonna get. But again, the key is not to stuff with SEO taboo things. Don't stuff with keywords. Don't um, think that all these backlinks are gonna help you. It's really about the value that you're showing your user. And that starts with establishing goals. So um, when I talk about goals, a lot of people think about their own business and their goals with their website. But you really need to take a step back and again, think about what somebody coming to your website wants. What's their goal? So why would someone need the information you offer? What are they gonna put into Google that will lead them to your business in such a way that they're gonna um, end up using your service product or visiting your store eventually? That's the first goal. Um, next, obviously, you need to think about yourself. So now we have our goals. And this is where um, you think about your broad business goals and then your specific website goals. And they, they go hand in hand. But if you're developing goals for your content and traffic to your website without talking to your sales team or um, your support team or anybody else in your company, then you're just, you're, um, your goals are disconnected. So when you're talking about sales and company goals, we're talking about ways to increase your sales, um, increase your customer count, spread your brand awareness, and then establish your authority in your industry. Um, a lot of marketers say that it takes about seven touch points to capture a customer, and that's one of the, this is one of those touch points. So your website goals can translate into these specific business goals that do um, directly, welcome, <laughs> that do directly translate into ROI. Um, so, some of those goals are like conversion rates, that increases your sales and your customer count, and then um, your conversions themselves, the number of conversions that you have, the more customers you have. Your website visits. So your website visits are obviously um, your audience, but then those are gonna translate into leads, and it spreads your authority and your brand awareness. And then social following and social shares. These, um, a lot of people call them superficial goals, and they somewhat are, but it's a way to make sure that you have an audience and that your um, brand is being, your, your content is being spread and um, it's just another way to engage your audience on another platform. So those are really important to have in there too. And I think we all probably know what a SMART goal is. Does anybody not know what a SMART goal is? Yes. I was like, I should, should I take this slide out? Um, perfect, I love SMART goals. So I'll show you an example of these at some point. Um, it's okay, welcome, get a seat. <laughs> so your SMART goals are basically gonna make it so that you can track your progress along the way, no matter what you're doing. Um, they need to be strategic, you need to think about what your goals are as a business, why are you doing this? They need to be measurable, so you have to have numbers in there, otherwise you're not gonna be able to figure out how well you're doing. Always include numbers. Attainable, don't be unrealistic. They need to be reliable. The numbers that you're taking can't be from um, a platform that doesn't do well. Like occasionally, actually Google, or not Google, Twitter analytics does have glitches occasionally. And so we've had a problem keeping track of our Twitter analytics and you have to figure out a way to find reliable data to take um, your smart goal information. And then time bound. Time bound is important because then you can track your progress towards your goal within a specific time frame. So some common smart content goals are to build your audience. Um, you wanna make sure that you have email list subscribers. Your email is your most powerful tool for content marketing. Um, you can drive traffic from social media, you can drive it from Google, you can drive it from paid ads, but those people who subscribe to your email list are probably the most important because they convert the most often and they're the most loyal people that you can have as a customer. <clears throat> And then you're gonna look at, wanna look at your overall audience. So those are audience members that you have like subscribed or in your social media channels, but you might have people who just visit your website. So you're gonna wanna look at website visitors and then um, sessions, page views, and then returning versus new. And those tell you different things. And if you have more questions about that, you can ask me later on. 
Um, social engagement, so shares, mentions, and likes. You want to make sure that not only are you getting followed, people are interacting. Website engagement. So are people landing on your site staying? Are they finding what they need? Um, are they interacting with your stuff or are they just bouncing and leaving and where are they doing that at? So that tells you where your content's falling short. And then sales and leads and conversion rates and like we said, that, that directly translates to your sales goals and whether or not your content is doing what you intend it to do. So that's all how you start out and then um, you have to publish regularly to get content on your site regularly, obviously. And to do that, it's, it's kind of... I'm stuck right now. <laughs> you have to publish regularly to get people on your site. And um, I've seen a few blogs out there that try to publish regularly, but then you go back and they don't have a new post up. And then I, I stop going to that blog again after a certain amount of time because I'm, they're not producing on the time frame that they were before. And so when you publish regularly, readers know what to expect from you. And it brings them back more often and more consistently. And then um, new readers find you easier because, like I said, if you're publishing regularly, people are sharing your content, Google's ranking it, um, and, you're, and you're findable in search engines. Um, Again, it increases organic traffic to your site because you're publishing all that content with these keywords, but you're not stuffing it with keywords. Um, and you're, you're getting quality traffic to those pages. So how often should you publish? As long as you publish regularly, it's okay. You don't have to publish every week, but publish on a regular schedule. And if your blog page says your schedule of content publication, it'll probably be better off for you, especially if you publish like once a month. So put up the top of your blog. Um, we'll have a new post every first week of the month. Um, but set that expectation for your website visitors so that they're not wondering where your content went if you only publish once a month or once a quarter. Um, but I recommend weekly for all businesses, twice a month if you, if you don't have that much time. And of course, nobody has the time to do this. And I know a lot of us are business owners, marketing managers, different things. You wear a lot of hats. So even as a content writer, there's so much to do with content. There's not enough time to produce like two posts a week if you're the only one doing it. So you really, really, really have to um, get people involved. All right, so who in here writes their own content right now for their business? Sweet. Who has a content writer that's not them? Nice. Um, and who has their marketing manager writing for them but they're not the marketing manager? Interesting, okay. Like, okay, that makes sense. Um, so like I said, if you're a content writer and your main job is to write content, then that's all you're doing all day, every day. But if you're a business owner, that's not all you're doing every day. And if you're a marketing manager, that's also not what you're doing every day. But content is huge for marketing. Oh, I missed one. If no one in particular is in charge of your content and it's just kind of supposed to be produced, eventually you won't produce that content and it won't be published regularly and you will lose those readers. So how do you get it done? Your team is the key. <coughs> Um, even if you have a content writer, it's really not ideal to have them working alone because you're producing content that isn't quality. Your content writer doesn't know the ins and outs of your industry as well as you do as the person who's in it every day. Um, my favorite example is I worked at a plumbing supply store for a few months and um, I had to do these articles about the new products that would come out and how the plumbers could use them in such a way that they, it wouldn't sound like somebody completely has no idea what they're talking about is writing it. And nobody at the company had the skill set or the time to write that article. So I would once a week on Thursdays go down and talk to the um, head cashier who's in charge of training people on the tools and say, what am I writing about this week? And then tell me they, what the benefits are, how they use it, how they can get it, and, and then walk away, write the article in 30 minutes. Instead of spending four hours researching and trying to figure out how I can use jargon to make it sound like it should, I write down what he says and I go write it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's an example of working with your team versus having your content writer sit there and try to figure out how to write their content. And you, you, know, you want content that your customers are gonna find value from. And if it's just somebody spinning up something that they're just trying to hit a keyword or a specific topic, it's not gonna go very well. Um, and that's how your, pro your content writer or you become an accidental project manager for just content. So each piece of content that you create requires expertise and research. You have to get that level in there where it's not just something they can Google. I mean, they can now that you've produced it. But <laughs> um, and then you have to get the writing done. So 
it, that's a lot harder than it sounds, actually. <laughs> I've, I'll get there. Um, and then media. So media is really important. If you don't include a featured image on your blog post, you're less likely to get social shares. Um, because, for example, if I am going to go post a piece of content from another website and it doesn't come up with a Twitter card or a Facebook preview image, I don't post it because it's not enticing to my audience to click on it. Um, and if I do, I have to take the time to go find a photo to post with it to make sure that it's there and so it takes me longer. So if your content is already ready and social, like, socially optimized for somebody to share, then it'll be shared more often. So that's why media is important. And that, that introduces a whole different aspect of content writing that your writer might not have the ability to do. Editing. Editing is really important. Um, I can't tell you how many posts I've read that are like my own. <laughs> and I was like, I should have edited this one more time. Um, editing is so important. SEO optimization, because you want to be found, and then distribution. So there are six steps to every single blog post that you're writing, and if you're doing one a week, that's a lot. And it's a lot to coordinate. So you need to look at your team and find out what their strengths are. What is everybody good at? How can you use them? How can they get involved? And how can you make it part of their everyday experience? That's my job. <laughs> so I am the one that gets to ping people on Slack and say, hey, you had this really awesome question from a customer in support, and I think that would make a great tutorial. You should probably go write that. And they do. Um, but it's because we've developed this culture where that's part of what we do. Um, everybody, in our, everybody in our team has um, a thing that they're good at, and they're, everybody is, is a writer. And even if they don't write well, their post gets edited by me and then pushed out. Um, so we, every post is a team effort. So Ben writes our tutorials. He's the one that I basically am always like, you need to go write this tutorial. You know this, and it's awesome. Um, Michelle, Michelle is our customer, head of customer success. So she actually has so much experience in so many different things that I have her write um, a lot of like fundraising topics, but then she's also really good at marketing, so I have her do stuff for WP Business Reviews. And her and Amanda actually just started producing video content for a team. It was their idea, they wanted to do it, they were like, we have all these random common questions that customers ask us, and we think they would make great two minute tips for our blog. And so we produce those, they go out on Twitter, and they do them, and it takes us like 30 minutes every week because we work as a team. There's like five people working on this project, but it only takes 30 minutes per person to do that. Um, and then Kirkland, <laughs> I had to add him because I didn't actually have him in here and I realized that I talked about how important media was, but he's the one who does all of our media. And every single post that we do, this poor guy, I <laughs> I'll end up changing the image like six times and he'll produce it. But if I were to do that, um, our images would be terrible. I don't know if anybody's ever seen our WP Business Reviews blog, but if you haven't, just go look at it for the featured images because he makes all of those and they're so good. Um, but that's one of the things that I think helps people, sorry guys, that's one of the things that I think helps people um, find our blog more is because they see that image on social media and they're like, that's cool, and it catches their attention. Um, so media is important. And then Matt. Matt is the check on my check. So he writes a lot of our stuff, he's head of community, but I'm the content writer and even I need to check. What I do isn't final either. Everything you do needs to be checked so many times to make sure that when it goes out, it's, there's no mistakes. Um, so he edits what I edit, which is nice. All right, so working with your team is a lot easier if you establish a process. So start with um, a timeline. Pick an ideal timeline. When do you want to publish? How soon in advance do you want to plan your content? This isn't our timeline, just so you know, but it's an example. Um, plan your content ahead of time. Write your content well ahead of time. Edit your content well ahead of time. And then go back and edit it again later. Create your supporting graphics. Because things can go wrong, guys. You, like, do it all in advance. And then format it. Get it ready. Schedule it. And then distribute it. So have a process down. And um, make sure that your team knows it and the expectations are set. Because um, otherwise, you're going to find yourself not publishing regularly. All right, so in order to figure out what you're gonna publish, you need to start with a con, I call it the content matrix. Our um, CFO likes to call it the Walden quadrant. <laughs> so um, basically you're gonna establish all the topics that you're gonna write about ever with one graphic um, or one chart. 
So first you're going to establish your voice. How do you want to sound online? What do you want your blog to sound like? What do you want your reputation to be? At Give, we're um, professional, educational, and friendly. And um, we try to make sure that we're educational versus academic because academic is a little bit less approachable. And so find those nuances and how you talk to your audience and figure out who you're talking to. And that way you know um, how you should sound. Then create avatars, and these are also called personas, but I, what I do is I go in and I actually look at specific customers. So my first ideal customer was a person named Jackie, and she's like this gung-ho fundraiser, and she uses Give, and she loves it, but she's like one of those, um, she's like a, I would call her like a, a WordPress blogger user, where like she uses WordPress, she knows how to use it, and she uses it for her cause, but she's not necessarily a developer or a marketer but she's an ideal customer of ours. So I use her entire Facebook profile to create an ideal persona for one of our customers. And then I went over to somebody who's a marketing agency owner. And I was like, this is another person that I would want because they're a freelancer and a marketing agency owner. And I used their profiles from LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook to create that persona. And same thing with a third customer. I think I picked an influencer of some sort in um, nonprofit space. And so you want to look at the details that you can add into um, add, add Add targeting. So those details that you're looking to build these avatars, you're going to look at their interests, you're going to look at their age, their demographic, and their location. And then you're going to want to look at other things like what platforms are they the most active on because you want to know where to spend your money to target that person when you're doing ads. Um, but that's for ads. And then once you have your people that you're talking to, you're going to want to figure out why they want to use your business. So figure out those hooks. Um, these are the most common ones. Value, quality, trustworthiness, and convenience. But you can also have like... Um, Prestige, keeping up with the Joneses. So if your product is way more expensive than, you, than your competitors, but it's really awesome, that's something that you can exploit in your content and talk about um, more, more high quality and upscale things. So put all of those into a chart and then figure out how you're going to talk to each ideal customer based on that message. And instead of hooks, you can also um, consider like benefits of using your business. Like what's the benefit of using you over a competitor? But um, fill in key messages. What do you want your audience to find? How do you want them to find you? And then generate blog post ideas from that. Um, another way to get blog topic ideas is to look at your common customer questions. And that's the way that we do our two minute tips. And then also um, your related questions. So if you go into Google and you type um, a keyword related to your business, there's a little box there that'll tell you what people type in that are questions. And if you look at those, those have great blog topic ideas. At Give, we actually have three article submission forms. So we have one for Give, we have one for WP Business Reviews, and now we have one for Impress.org. Um, so anybody on our team at any time can go in there and they can say, hey, I want to write a blog about this topic. But they have to tell me the title, the summary, who their target audience is, what the key message is, and what benefit we're going to get from it. So all of the things that we talked about with the goals in the beginning are all in the blog template so that when my team is thinking about what blogs they want to produce, they're um, addressing those goals that we're working towards. And it's not just producing content to produce content. So once they submit the form, then I create a blog post template. And so I actually have um, a template that has um, all of these things on it. Title, the biggest, so the biggest two on here are the, the goal and the offer and then the value. And you want to have your target audience too because you want them to know who they're talking to. So the bottom three are the things that my team needs to know the most. The rest of them are just meta that I need to have when I put the post in WordPress. But at the top of our um, template is actually this. And it, I'm going to add to it soon. Um, this is still a work in progress. We're actually working on this as a team right now. Um, but everybody on my team starts off with instructions on how to write a blog because not everybody is a writer. And it has what their target keywords or what their target number of words should be based on the type of post that it is and um, how to write, how to use the information that's below. So I give them a keyword, but I don't want them to necessarily like stuff it. I want them to keep it in mind. Um, and then I give them an outline. So it just has instructions. So if your template might look completely different, but however you need your team to function, make sure that's there in front of them all the time because it helps establish habits. So not everyone is a writer. Just set your team up for success, guys. Writing is really hard. Um, 
You can also add things if your team is like really not a writing team and you're just like, my team sucks at writing. You can add writing resources, links to things that help you write blogs, a publishing checklist. I'm actually gonna add this soon to ours where like when you're done, did you run it through the Hemingway editor so that I don't have to edit it more? And did you um, check it with Grammarly? Do you have, um, I don't know, the keyword in the title, things like that. So if you have a checklist for them to, to be done with their post, then that can help too. And then if you have a company like Tone Guide or Brand Guide, that's another good thing to link to in your blog template. They do what? Um, a Tone Guide or a Brand Guide. So I give, we have a Support Tone um, Guide. I think that's what it's called. I'm probably wrong about that. But <laughs> it helps um, when, we're, when we're talking to people in general or even on social media, the, way, the language we use and the way we talk to them. Um, like a, like a set of standards. Yeah, so like if you've seen brand standards, it's kind of like that, but it's more about the language that you use. And I actually include that in my brand standards when I create them for companies. Um, so especially if you don't have a large team, you need to connect and automate your workflow. Um, and even if you do have a team, you need to connect and automate your workflow. You need to be able to plan, write, collaborate, edit, and publish all of your stuff every week within the same time frame. Um, and so again, you need tools to plan and organize, you need task management tools, you need scheduling tools, editing tools, graphic design, photography, and SEO optimization. There's so many tools that you need, even if you have a team. I'm gonna give you a few. Disclaimer, I am not tool agnostic. <laughs> I use what I use and I love it and there are alternatives and I can try to tell you about a few of those later on, but I can't um, endorse them because I've never used them. So, some basic tools are free things like Google Drive. Hey guys, guess what? Drive is awesome to work with a team. Um, spreadsheets, calendar, and Google Docs. Google Docs is our best friend. And then paid tools. So, even if you're using something like that, you're gonna want maybe something like CoSchedule or Social Web Suite. Um, I haven't actually used Social Web Suite, but I put the two up here that are social media schedulers and integrate with WordPress. Um, I don't know much about Social Web Suite, but I do know that CoSchedule also has a task management system and a whole project management suite feature that you can have. So I personally use CoSchedule for that reason. I use it for project management, to integrate with WordPress. It also integrates with MailChimp. You would love that, Amy. <laughs> it's all, I love CoSchedule. Super awesome. Yeah, see, there you go. But yeah, so it'll integrate with all those things and then it'll automate your process and you'll get all these notifications. You'll know what's going on all the time. And if you're wondering why, Every one of those lines is a social media post. So that's why I use CoSchedule. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Let's just take a look. Okay. So is the platform like Hootsuite the same? Or is that different? Nope. It's different. So Hootsuite is a really good social media scheduling tool. It's a good social media listening tool. But it doesn't integrate with WordPress and it doesn't have task management. And those are the two things that I needed to make sure that my content machine was running well. Um, the social listening tools I could supplement elsewhere and then the, the scheduling is in CoSchedule. I have used Hootsuite before um, and I think actually I switched to CoSchedule from Hootsuite. So. CoSchedule does everything. Literally everything. Yeah. And they have great support, like great support. I'm not paid by CoSchedule at all. I just <laughs> love it. <laughs> all right, so. Um, if you don't wanna use those, you can create a team of tools. There are a lot of free things out there that you can use. Trello is great for task management. Um, if you need to create those checklists but you don't wanna pay for CoSchedule, put all of your content into Trello. Buffer, um, the free social media scheduling tool that you can use but it has limitations. You can only have a certain amount of profiles and I think you have to pay to use it for Instagram. I'm not sure. Yeah, you, do. you do, you have to pay to use it for Instagram. So then you can also use TweetDeck. It's a free schedule, but scheduler but only for Twitter. And then writing tools. Okay, so Grammarly. How many of you have heard of Grammarly? Awesome. Use it. Grammarly every day? <laughs> yeah, I, I use Grammarly. Like, it's just really good. It calls attention to your errors. Um, and then beyond Grammarly, Hemingway. Yes. You mentioned Hemingway. Hemingway. I just opened it up right now. It's amazing. I love this. I, uh, I'm going to make my team use it. I love it. I use it to check myself when I'm writing. So like once I'm done and I edit it, I put it in Hemingway and I'm like, you need to tell me if I made a mistake. Because it has like algorithms to tell you if your sentences are too long or using complicated words. Um, and it's perfect for blog writing. It's not great for academic writing, but it's the perfect blog editor. 
<laughs> it is free. It is free. I'm sorry. Yeah, that would be good for bios too. Um, I, I'm just saying it's not an academic editor because it, it breaks up your sentences and makes you use less complicated words. So it's like internet writing. <laughs> um, and then media. So you can't pay to hire a graphic designer all the time. Use Canva. Use Unsplash. Get these stock images, but make sure they're free and you have the right to use them. <laughs> I tweaked your Unsplash photos because it's rude not to oh. give them <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> Tweet credit about your Unsplash photos. <laughs> and then Yoast. So there are there is also all-in-one SEO, but I have only ever used Yoast, so I can't um, speak about any of the other SEO plugins. But make sure you have an SEO plugin, because like I said, if you don't have social optimization, you don't have a social media image to share, people aren't going to share your posts as much. And Yoast makes sure that you have that. So you have all this stuff going on and you're like, it's crazy, I started this project and I have this team doing all these things. Take time to explore the process, be consistent. I say for at least three months. I always give it three months to see how things are going and what effect um, it has. And then I go back. So evaluate, readjust, and then repeat the process every three months. Figure out where you're, where you're missing the mark and then go back. <coughs> This is our workflow I give. So I'm gonna give you now kind of more of an actual overview of what we do. Um, one of our team members submits an idea to the blog form or I decide that I wanna write something. And the blog template is filled out. So I create a document, I create a folder this, um, within our drive. And then we write the post. It goes through rounds of editing and feedback. I think we go through at least three rounds of editing and feedback um, just to make sure that everything is good to go before we even go to WordPress. Then we create graphics and featured images and we make sure that we have all the supporting materials ready and they're all in the folder in the drive and everything's in the same spot. And then I put it in WordPress and we format it and um, make sure that it's um, optimized. And then we actually edit it again as a team and I don't think I put that stuff in here and we, we send a preview link out to everybody and make sure that everybody reads it and it's good to go. So you check your checks every time. And then you publish and you create your distribution schedule. So after you publish and you, you distribute it, then I actually read it again because sometimes you'll find things that you didn't find the first seven times. Do you read from the bottom up? No. Read from the bottom up. How? That's so you read from the bottom up like you... You scan from the bottom okay, up. Okay, okay. And so if you have doubles, like double words, or you're using oh. your own vernacular of your or their, You'll see it from the bottom up because your brain's not reading, it's scanning. Oh my gosh, that's how, okay, so usually I wait like 24 hours to edit a post and that would completely make that process much faster. So yeah, scan it from the bottom up, <laughs> right? <laughs> what do you know? Um, no, that's okay, I love that, that's a good idea. So once you've done this, you need to report back to your team. Your team's not gonna care if they don't know how they did. Like. I published this post, awesome, did anybody read it? I don't know. <laughs> cool. Um, so go back to those goals, those SMART goals that you had. These are not our real goals, some of them are, but I changed a few to make the graph look better. <laughs> um, go back to your SMART goals, look at what they are, start a spreadsheet and track them month to month, quarter to quarter, figure it out. Put in what you started with at the beginning of where you established this goal. Put in your end goal and your end date so you know when you're supposed to stop and what that number is. Um, and then every time you're taking that, that, that measurement, we do it once a month and once a quarter, um, you find out what you need based on your end goal. So what do you need every month to re reach that end goal? And then what did you actually get that month? And how close are you to your goal? So. We actually just did our quarterly update and um, this spreadsheet is still in the works and when it's done I'm probably going to publish our blog post template and this template for people to use but until it's finalized I'm not going to give people those resources because they're not awesome yet. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah. That is a good question. Um, so all the things. Um, one more thing and then I'll talk about that. Also make sure that every week you're telling them how their posts do. So like if 
you know, somebody just published a post, don't wait three months to tell them how they did. Tell them that week. Um, tell them how all the things did. What I use to track them is Google Analytics, Twitter Analytics, CoSchedule Analytics. That's another awesome feature of CoSchedule. And I think it's more accurate sometimes than Twitter. Um, it might always be more accurate than Twitter. But CoSchedule Analytics is one. Twitter, Facebook. I use all the native analytics, and actually, if you guys have any YouTube content, their analytics platform is insane. Yeah. Like, you can click and click and click and keep finding more. I love it. Um, but, so those, those are the things that I look at, and it's, you have to piece it all together, and that's why I have one spreadsheet where I bring them all, all back together. So, if you take anything away today, it's that your, your team is a key to um, a successful content strategy, and this is my team. Well, some of them, most of them. <laughs> All right, guys. I don't know how much time we have left, but good. questions? Yeah, you're good. We've got, you need 10 minutes for questions, I think. Oh, sweet. That was really quick. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned you have a team. Um, what do you think is the most important thing you need to have a specific set of questions that you ask them? Is there anything? Usually, that you will ask, ask for posts? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it really depends on their industry um, and the topic that you're going for. So, if you're trying to write a post maybe to convert like sales for them, you might figure out um, something that would bring somebody in that doesn't sound like a sales gimmick. And I would ask them the benefits and it really does depend on the post too. So I would make sure that you know, like if you're doing something for sales, like benefits, if you're doing something for their industry that's like thought leadership, just make sure that you know in depth how to use it and the specific language. I think that the language is the biggest key. So if you're using the wrong terminology for something, that's gonna kill the post just dead right there. Um, and as a content writer, I sometimes do have to be like, even at Give, I go back and I'm like, okay, I'm not a developer guys, can you dumb this down a little bit so I can figure it out and edit it properly? Um, and that's one of the biggest things I think is just making sure you know their terminology really well. Anybody? Question. So, yeah. um, I'm still deciding on like how am I going to set up my blog. Uh, so I have had uh, created um, you know blog that classic blog on uh, WordPress, but then like I keep find myself finding uh, uh, enjoying blogs from Medium, mm. and I found, I, I, I've seen that some uh, people, they've been able to like embed or they're able to create their own subdomain name on Medium or somehow connect it with their own um, their own website, Yeah. and I'm like, whoa, that's pretty cool, like, you, you know, you have that credibility of Sweet. being a you know, Medium writer, but also it, you know, kind of joins together with your entire company. Yeah, I think somebody, I was talking to somebody earlier that told me they only blogged on Medium. Was it you? Yeah. How does that work? Yeah, it's fine. Medium's okay. <laughs> it's, it's, it could be used as a, uh, uh, another place to link to other things. Um, so it's a, it's a good tool to use. I, I like how easy it is to write on it. But um, yeah, I mean, it depends. Like what you're talking about is branding your business, and Medium is probably not the best place to do that. So. Yeah, I would say, because it's, it's a third-party platform. So if you're, if you're trying to instill trust and transparency in your brand, a third party platform is not where you want to be. Um, you need to be on your own domain. But like some people do publish first on WordPress and then take pieces and put it elsewhere with links back to the original post. So that's another route you could go. Yeah. You mentioned in your blog post not to fill it with too many keywords yeah. or jargon. How do, what is the, um, I guess the ratio that you use for balance? and then? How is that actually, um, when you do publish it, I, I guess it, it's probably in the optimization, which I don't know much about. Um, so if you could just speak to that process and how that translates into when people search for it. Oh yeah, totally. Oh, this is my favorite topic. <laughs> cool. Um, so your keywords are, especially because Google changed a lot of stuff last fall, your keywords now don't matter as much, but they still do because of the word, they're the words people put in Google. But um, I recommend putting them in the title, at least one H2 header. Um, it needs to be in the alt tag of an image, particularly your featured image would be the best. 
and um, it needs to be in your meta description for Google. So like in, in the Yoast meta box, your keyword should be in there too and in the, in the SEO title. So yeah, totally. Um, I should add that slide to this sometime. But uh, your title of your post, an H2 title in, within the post, your alt tag on your featured image, the meta description on Yoast, and then the SEO title on Yoast. So if you, if it's, if you can't work the keyword into your post title, put it into the Yoast SEO title somehow. And if that still sounds forced, don't put it there because don't force it. <laughs> what does H2 title mean? It's a, it's a second heading. Yeah, it's a subheading. So on, like, on your post, um, WordPress formats your post with the title as H1, and then Google reads that as the title of that page. And so if you have two H1s, Google will say there's an error on your page and it hurts your, your ranking. So you go from H1 to H2, and then there's like beyond that. But H2 is really the important one for that. Um, and then as far as how search engines find that, so Google especially is trying to make search more, more human oriented. So they try to make their search engine work the way a person would think. So when you're thinking about writing your post and you're thinking about what you should link to and things like that, you need to think about when somebody's reading it or when they're finding it, how they would find it and where they would naturally want to go next. Um, so you're not going to type into Google, I don't know, landscaping, best flowers. You're going to say, what are the best flowers for Southern California? City. Yeah, or like what are the best flowers for landscape? You're going to type it in as a question. Nobody's going to type in an awkward term, especially because we do a lot of voice search now. So um, what you're actually doing is kind of optimizing for voice search when you're doing things like that. Um, but then as far as inside your post and everything, even the, the links that you're linking to need to be logical and the way that your, format, your post is formatted. So um, those keywords, are, they're in there because they, they add to the, the weight of the keyword in Google. But what's really happening is Google's looking at your post and how it leads to different things, and if that's how somebody would look. So I just wrote a post on, um, no, I edited it. We're, we're releasing a post on like snippets that you can add to customize your forms. And at the top of the post, I've linked to like a tutorial that we don't necessarily want in our post, but somebody might need. And so you link directly to the resources that those people need. And so Google sees that, a person sees that, and anybody searching that doesn't have to go off your page. They go directly to what they need. So if you're writing in the way that somebody would naturally need to use your content, that makes sense. And it might not seem ideal that I'm leading them off our page, but they know that I just gave them a resource and they're going to keep that in mind and come back later. And open a new tab. Exactly. Open a new tab. Make sure it opens in a new window when you add that link in there. <laughs> so would you recommend writing the titles as questions? I actually, that's one of the things that's in our blog template, is that if you can write it as a question, do. Not always, but... Um, yeah, the meta description. In the meta description is always a question. It's always a pain point that the blog post solves. Yeah. The questions always drive curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if you're not using a question, numbered posts are good, like list posts. And um, those are my two favorite, really. <laughs> they do. So list posts are great. And especially if you're trying to connect your, sites to, your site to others and like establish where you belong, um, do a curated list post. I did one for a sports scorekeeping application that was um, a, a, a post of top 10 TED Talks for coaches. And it links to all these like high authority sports related things. But it just gives the context for Google when they're looking at you saying, oh, they're related to sports. Um, yeah, so does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, uh, good. Could you just repeat, I'm sorry, you said the, um, the keywords uh, should be in the Header, title, featured image, meta title. The meta description and then the SEO description in the meta box. Mm -hmm. If you use Yoast, it'll come to that. Yeah. Any other questions, guys? So, yeah. Uh, as far as uh, you said uh, custom images, uh, you, you have a, a graphic designer that creates a custom images for you. How, are they pictures or are they like uh, what, what is it, what does it do and are, if you're using like like something like the splash is are you do you ever worry about having duplicate pictures that sometimes I see the same pictures on different blog posts yeah different people all the time we at Impress in particular, we use both. We have vector images and we have real images. And when we use a stock photo, 
our designer ends up changing it in some way or we put something on it that makes it a little bit different. Um, but when I'm writing, like, ooh, sorry. When I'm writing for my own blog um, or just a general business blog, I don't really necessarily worry as much that the image is used multiple times. It's just that it has one. Um, but yeah, if you see one that you've seen like 17 times because it's like the most used stock photo out there, like there's this one of some dude on a computer that's frustrated that I've seen in like <laughs> seven WordCamp talks, including my own. <laughs> so, I mean, if you've seen the image multiple times, don't use it. But um, Unsplash is really good about having a lot of content. And Pexels, if you've never heard of Pexels, they have a video um, system so you can get video content that way. Pexels? For free. Pexels. P P E X E L S. Yeah. All right. I'm around for questions, you guys. If you have more, I'll be outside so I'm not in the way. <laughs> Thank you.